Now, I just want to put something out there. And don't take this the wrong way. Just state the facts. The other night, I was having a look at some of the statistics that YouTube provides me. And as it turns out, there are tens of thousands of you folks stopping by my little garage here every day. Into all hours of the night, even. Complete disregard for the sleeping kids. Tens of thousands. And that's pretty cool, actually. Plus, me and the missus are hip like that. Mi casa su casa. But not a single one of you has had us over for dinner. Wait, wait, wait. Before you leave an invite down in the comments, it's too late now. We both know it'd just be weird and we'd end up talking about the weather. Hey, welcome back to the shop. To all you folks that like hearing me talk, have I got something for you today. A ton of it, actually. A smidge over a ton of talking. I keep a list here on my phone of things I think of or people might ask about that I just couldn't do an episode on in and of themselves. So I just hold on to them and save them up for these poop shoots. Now I've got a few items, so what I'll do is work through them in alphabetical order. However, I don't have anything that starts with the letter A. So I went and I grabbed this apple. If you're wondering why I'm about to talk about an apple, come on man, pay attention. I literally just told you one sentence ago that it starts with the letter A. I think somewhere deep down in all of our genetic code lie the instructions on how to eat one of these things. I mean, ever since Isaac Newton invented the apple, people everywhere have been eating it the same way. You with me? Let me tell you a story. Many moons ago, I worked in a steel mill. In fact, I still have my flip-down welding glasses. These are clip-ons. They kind of go into the front of a hard hat. It was a dirty job, but I'll be honest, it was incredible. I mean, just like you see in the movies, it was dark. There was fire everywhere. Tons of handsome, shirtless young men. I don't know if you can imagine this, but it was the kind of place that, like, a four-inch square piece of red-hot steel could come at you at any second, going 100 miles an hour, and kill you before you could even say, Hey, Joe, how'd our lottery numbers do? Very few other processes, I think, are really as spectacular as, like, a two-story furnace melting and pouring metal. Few other places sort of show our mastery over the natural world in such a dramatic display. In fact, after this video, go find a video too on some big electric arc furnaces. Now even my tangents are going off on tangents. As you might imagine, a place like that is full of some pretty interesting people. Intimidating. You know, weathered, tired, underpaid, most times out drinking too late the night before. And all of them strong as an ox. I mean, absolutely wonderful people once you get to know them. But I think it must be part of the job description that you should be intimidating. At the very least, capable of putting on a convincing who-you-looking-at face. They also tend to have a disproportionate number of people named Lefty, or Stubby, or Pirate. Wait, maybe not Pirate, but anyway, you, you get the picture. Now, of all the roughnecks I had to slowly win over, there was one guy who was most intimidating. One guy who stood out. The one guy all the folks that scared me were scared of. Now, the peculiar thing is that he wasn't particularly, you know, big or mean looking. He was quite the opposite. He was rather quiet and to the point. He had sort of an intelligent calm about him. Now, he wasn't like the boss boss. It wasn't that. He was, I don't know, maybe a day shift manager or something. One of the guys, essentially. But he had this thing about him I couldn't quite put my finger on. Like, you could sense the moment he walked into the room, even when you couldn't see him. Kind of like a poltergeist. And you just sort of put your head down and do your job. Of course, me being the new guy, I didn't know any of this. To me, he was the least scary. I hadn't yet learned what everyone else knew. You know, I'd have no problem calling him over when I needed something. I'd look him in the eyes when we talked. Even sat next to him at lunch one time. Little did I know, I was playing with fire. I should get to my point. Grandpa Simpson has nothing on me. This guy had a habit of carrying an apple around with him. He'd have his clipboard, hard hat, safety gear, and an apple. I guess like a mid-morning snack? I'm not sure. Until that one fateful day when I saw him actually eating it. Now, I'm not quite sure how to put this in the words, so I'm just going to put it out there. He'd eat the whole apple, the entire apple, everything. Core, stem, seeds, blossom. There was no rhyme or reason to how he'd have at it. I mean, one day he'd start on the side like a normal person, and the next he'd start on the bottom. Eat his way up the middle and finish off with the stem. Or start with the stem and head right for the bottom. It just wasn't human. And right then and there is when it dawned on me. What I was missing that everyone knew. There was no other explanation. This man, this quiet, unassuming man, had to be a serial killer. Not long after, I ended up leaving that job. 
not because of him or the job. It was a great job. It just happened that I was moving to a new city. I often wonder whatever became of those folks. They were good people, but I can only assume that Apple Man killed and ate them all. That takes us to the letter B, ball turners. To be honest, I don't have too much to say about ball turners in general, but this one seemed to spur some curiosity in the vice handle video. And yes, I do have two. One for the mill and one for the shaper. Turns out they're both 14 millimeter squares. The shaper in particular, not only is the vice 14 millimeter square, but all of the axes happen to be that size. So a lot of bang for the buck there out of one handle. I guess 14 millimeter square was a popular size back then. So I built one into sort of a tool holder body, or rather I built a dovetail into the body so it takes the place of an entire tool holder on the tool post. You'll notice it has no height adjustment screws, and that's to allow me to use it in both orientations. So I could drop it in the tool post this way, or flip it and drop it in this way, which allows me to get it to work potentially from two different directions. This was built to do both convex and concave shapes, so sort of balls on this side and like grooves or concave faces, I guess, on the other side. They're both actuated with a wrench. There's the tool for the concave turning. And this side is for the convex. The ball side, or the convex side, also has small seats in both ends. And it takes a little pin that allows you to measure the distance the tool is from the center line, or the radius that the tool is set up to cut. The problem with this ball turner is that I made it too big. And as a consequence of that, if I'm trying to turn steel, it's not as rigid as it could have been. It was a bit of my eyes being bigger than my stomach situation. I was building it, figured I'd make it as big as I could. And with use, it's gotten some wear in the pivots. I mean, these arms could use some reinforcing. Again, for plastic and aluminum, it seems to work great. For steel, it chatters quite a bit. Let's go give it a try. So the concave side of this is about an inch in diameter. I wish I would have made it smaller. I mean, with the tool stick out, probably the smallest I could cut is, I don't know, an inch and a quarter, maybe an inch and an eighth. I built this side mostly to be able to make my own dies for the bender, like sets of pipe dies for tubing, pipe, round stock. The top and bottom have the sloppy hexes cut into them, and I can get in here sort of with a long wrench to get my hand out of the way of the chuck. You might have noticed that's not a perfect sphere. I didn't really bother to set up the tool for this diameter work. But there you have it. That's how I made my own hip replacements. Let's head back over to the bench. Now, although you're looking at milling cutters, I'm still on the letter B. I happened to be in the scrap guy's neighborhood, and I popped in for a quick visit. He didn't really have much of anything new, but I did pick up a few more cutters. I got some larger milling cutters a couple of roughing end mills, this big piece of high-speed steel. I thought that was kind of funny, like an inch square high-speed steel turned down into a little grooving tool. I got really excited about these dovetail cutters. These are brand new. They're 60 degree. I'm pretty sure I have that arbor size, but I guess I'll find out. But what I really wanted to share with you was this boring bar. I mean, take a look at the size of this thing. It must have been, I don't know, four to five feet long and maybe four inches in diameter. Something like this must take either like me, four regular guys, or an overhead crane to load into a tool post. I regret not having asked how much he wanted for it. I obviously can't use this thing. I mean, it, it probably weighs more than my lathe does. But it would have made a heck of a piece of wall art. Maybe convert it into like an overhead lamp or something. I can't even imagine the kind of machine that this thing goes on. But have a close look. The, the head on the boring bar is actually dovetailed, kind of like a boring head. So I don't know if it's just to permit finer adjustments than maybe a cross slide could handle. I mean, if anybody recognizes this as maybe a specialized tool, I'd love to hear it. Okay, so now we're up to the letter C. Let's talk about syndicators. Sorry, I mean cosine error. Now, I know, I know, I heard you rolling your eyes from here, but bear with me a moment. 
This will be brief. I happened across a couple of videos recently that brought up the subject of cosine error in indicator measurements. And I gotta be honest, I hate that name. Now I perfectly understand why it's called cosine error, but it makes it sound like it's the cosine's fault. It's not the cosine's fault. It's your fault. I'd ask you to please contemplate the following. This is a piece of teak. I planned to make an air rifle stock out of this, but have since changed my mind. Let's say your boss asked you to measure how long it was, and you measured it across the diagonal. In this case, it measures about 32 and a half inches. Your boss cues it up, and after a lot of work, realizes that it's actually 31 and three quarter inches, not 32 and a half. What do you think would happen when that got back to him or her? I'll tell you what would happen. They'd probably smile as they patted you on the back and said, oh, that cosine error. And you'd both laugh as the closing credits rolled by. Now, to state the obvious, your dimension was longer than the real dimension because you measured it across the diagonal. In this case, the diagonal is at 13 degrees to the dimension that you wanted. Your 32 and a half inches was 13 degrees away from the 31 and three quarter the boss was looking for. If you would have multiplied your number by the cosine of 13 degrees, your 32 and a half would have become 31 and three quarter. That, or you could have measured it like a normal person. The point of this is that the angle at which you take your measurement obviously affects your measurement. And the relationship between the angle you're taking it at and the angle you probably actually want is related through the cosine. Hence, the cosine error. It's got a bad rap if you ask me. You are looking at two styles of indicator, a dial indicator on the left and a test indicator on the right. Dial indicators have a plunger that moves linearly to take a linear measurement. Test indicators have an arm that swings to take a linear measurement. Now, just like a tape measure, not very many people would use a dial indicator at an angle, or at least not for very long anyway. Now, I want you to notice that the dial indicator is still taking a measurement. It's not wrong per se, it's just not the measurement that we want. What it's doing is it's adding the cosine of 60 degrees to that measurement. I mean, it's not adding it, but it's increasing the measurement by the cosine of whatever angle it's tipped at. And you know what has always amazed me? Things like this block of metal with the indicator or the lump of wood with my tape measure, they always get their trigonometry right. I screw mine up all the time, but a dumb piece of wood has never slipped on a trig measurement. Now, here's where things can start to get a little bit funny. The arm on a test indicator rotates about a pivot point. But it's not taking an angular measurement. This thing isn't reading out how many degrees I rotated this pivoting arm. It's giving me a linear measurement. Now, since my test indicator is a little bit small and a little hard to get the details on camera, I've built a scale replica of it. Let me just grab it. All right, so as it turns out, I've run into a little problem here. I don't have a lens really large enough to get that whole indicator. So I've made a scale model of my scale model. I sure hope you folks appreciate the amount of effort that goes into making these models. So I've got the indicator arm, in this case, pointing straight down. And if I try to take a measurement like that, the needle doesn't move. So let's take this too far, shall we? The indicator tip is hitting the work at 90 degrees. The cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So isn't the lack of indicator motion, or zero, technically the correct answer? Now if we take the indicator arm and lay it down close to zero degrees, or as parallel with the surface as possible, things start to add up. The cosine of zero degrees is one, so the tip movement and the dial reading are the same. Multiplying by one usually gets you the same number. Or if we use our tape measure analogy, the tape measure is straight. If we put the indicator angle at some intermediate angle, say 30 degrees, the indicator is reading the tip motion with a dab of 30 degrees mixed in. And by dab, I mean cosine, effectively giving us an error. They usually build these things with a friction hinge, so you can adjust it to suit your measuring situation. The important bit about the angle of this arm is that it's sort of as parallel to the surface you want to measure as possible. Otherwise, the indicator is going to get all overzealous and start to do some trigonometry when you might not want it to. Now, in practice, for a home gamer, within reason, cosine error is really more something to be aware of than it is to be worried about. If you're off by 10 degrees and you're trying to measure, say, 15 thou, 
your indicator would tell you that it's two tenths under. So what's under the tip is 15 thou, but your indicator is telling you two tenths less than that. It's up to you if you want to sweat that or not. I've got two more C's, cat and camera. Quite a few of you have been asking about the cat, and I have some bad news, so I hope you watch YouTube sitting down. After the cat cameo video, I received a negative comment about cats in general, which really put my back up against the wall. I had no other choice but to put the cat down. I'm just kidding, just kidding, the cat's fine. Not long after that video, the cat's real owner showed up. I don't think I need to get into how dramatic that was. Lots of crying and screaming, temper tantrums for days, just inconsolable. My wife and kids didn't like it much either. For the record, my boy had called naming rights the second he saw the cat. The cat was hence known as Christmas Lights. Well, technically it was Christmassy Lights. Now I'm left with a litter box, food, cat toys, and a giant hole in my heart. Which brings me to cameras. By popular demand, here's the camera I've been using, the Nikon D300S. It's a little long in the tooth, pushing almost 10 years now. But with a little bit of hand holding, it's been pulling its weight. I started off with the cool pics you see here on the left. It's a P300. And although this little thing does full HD, and the big one doesn't, I never really liked it for filming down here. The sensor in this is just too small for the poor lighting I have in the garage. I mean, the DSLR isn't much better to be honest, but a larger sensor kind of helped. Plus, I never really took advantage of full HD. File sizes were huge for what I thought was only a marginal increase in video quality. Though it never dawned on me until recently that people can watch YouTube on TVs bigger than my local movie theater. Now, I could talk about cameras forever. So I will. Nikon DSLRs, in general, suck at video. In fact, I think it was probably just a late game change. Somebody got a call from someone in marketing that said add video capabilities to our cameras and they did it the night before the big launch. I mean, apart from this thing's autofocus karate being a joke, it also has a five minute video limit. Like it'll just stop at five minutes and you've got to start again. And you can only do so many five minute bits at a time before the sensor overheats. And it has no articulating screen. So sometimes if I'm trying to be too clever getting a shot, this thing might be six feet off the ground at the top of my tripod pointing down and I've got to climb up a ladder. Now, if you want to get into YouTube, I recommend a proper camcorder or a camera intended to do video. Now that said, the camera you use, I don't think is very important. And what I mean by that is if you actually had good lighting, the camera you have in your phone is probably more than sufficient, you know, for YouTube. Your phone might even do 4K video. Your router might burst into flames when you try to upload that 4K video. But the point is the quality is there. The thing I struggle with the most and the element I think is much more important is the audio quality, which is kind of ironic because I'm having quite a bit of trouble with this video's audio in particular. I'm filming this video with a D500. It's the upgrade to this camera that I've been waiting for. But anyway, a lot of stuff has changed. It's new territory. The sound works a little bit different, I think. And you may be hearing and complaining about the swings and level. But I have no intention of going back and refilming all of this nonsense. But you know, live and learn. Anyway, I was saying I think the audio is much more important than the video. In general, I think it's safe to say that people will put up with poor quality video and less likely to put up with even 4K ultra video if it has bad sound quality. Now, I happen to be in a concrete garage full of metal, which is probably the worst combination for good audio quality. I've gone through two or three different microphones. They get marginally better sort of with each upgrade, but nothing really solves the fundamental problem that I'm in a concrete box. I'm currently using one of these Rode video mics. It's plugged into the camera and I've got to move it around every time I move the camera. So the D500 I'm now filming this on still can't autofocus in video. Everything you see here is manual focus and is why some of my shots are often out of focus. But it does a lot better in lower light, so it's a better fit for my sort of situation down here. It's got much better manual controls for video compared to the D300 and it's got some kind of anti-flicker feature. And let me tell you, Flickr has been the bane of my YouTube existence. I use Adobe Premiere Elements. I start off with Windows Movie Maker. It was probably fine for what I'm doing. But I got some kind of email. Buy it now. It's Christmas time. $79.99. And I've really come to like it. It's a step up from Movie Maker. I mean, it's not professional software. 
but for what I'm doing, it's quick and easy to use. It sort of gets the job done, so that's what I've stuck with. I did download a free trial of After Effects once. I think it was 15 days, 30 days, I don't recall. I did use it for one or two special effects. I used it for the Jimmy Duresta teleport gag at the end of the Vortex video. But After Effects, I mean, it was it was just too over the top for me. You have to be like a nuclear brain surgeon to work with that thing. And to be honest, it was a lifestyle change me and my family aren't quite ready for. Next up, the letter D. And fortunately, finally, that gets us past the halfway point in the alphabet. Now, I wish I could share some deep and enlightening insights into the pros and cons of these things what to look for, or which ones to buy. Kind of like that other YouTube guy that does the tool reviews. And I'm not talking about the lame tool reviews, those boring ones. I'm talking about that quirky Canadian guy. What's his name? But I can't do that. I only just got this thing. I guess all I'm really telling you is I got a new drill. I've always been a Bosch guy, and for no particular reason other than it was the first good one I bought. And I suppose that triggered my brand loyalty man gene. Sure, I can tell you stories about how I've dropped this off of a 30-foot ladder at the top of the Empire State Building that was being transported on a jumbo jet, and how it still works just fine. But I'm going to go out on a limb and guess any good pro brand you buy would likely do the same. Now, I've squeezed every last drop of blood out of these. And in the last video, in the tool tightening fixture video, when it took me two batteries to get through a quarter inch piece of steel, I knew I couldn't keep the charade up any longer. When the craziest thing happened, I put my coat on and grabbed my keys, and as I stepped outside, a Milwaukee helicopter landed in my backyard. A suit came running out and said, I think you can use this, and handed me a new drill. I mean, it was surreal. And their helicopter? It was battery powered. All right, all right, you got me. I went out and I bought this. I'll be honest, I bought this because of the ones that looked like they were of decent quality, this one was on sale and was the cheapest. Fortunately, it was also the one that looked the least like a sneaker. Still don't quite trust this thing down here in the shop. I'm expecting that any minute it's gonna do something like this. Though I can give you some quick first impressions. I do like that it's smaller, it's more compact. The grip is thinner, that feels a little bit more comfortable in my hand. I do prefer the pistol grip angle of the Bosch. You can see this one is sort of pointing up a bit, and this one is almost, well, it's kind of parallel to the bottom. It feels more natural to me when I have this in my hand. Sort of the way my arm, wrist, and hand falls seems to put the drill in line. Whereas with the Milwaukee, the natural grip seems to have sort of like that downward lean toward it. I have to consciously straighten it out. Again, maybe splitting hairs and is just my muscle memory. The last thing I'm not too sure about is this little light that they have down here. I mean, maybe it'll come in handy. Perhaps it's better than holding a flashlight in your mouth. But frankly, if you're drilling in the dark, you've probably got your reasons. So I double dipped on a lot of letters. And if I do my math right, that takes us to the letter T. Tangential cutting tools. Let's head back over to the lathe and chat about the cutting edge of 19th century lathe tech. In the high-speed steel grinding video, we talked about the angles and consequent grinding required to form a piece of tool steel into a cutting tool. It wasn't complicated, but we needed to make three or four grinds to get the proper relief and clearance angles. Well, allow me to blow what's left of your YouTube watching mind. I'd ask you to please recycle some graphics. So we started with a high-speed steel tool blank with a square end loaded in the traditional way in the tool post in a tool holder. And in order to get that to cut, we had to grind again sort of front, side, top, relief and clearance angles. As that tool wears out, of course, you'd have to go back and either resharpen or freshen those edges. But what if instead you were to hold the tool like this, tangentially to the work? Now, hopefully it's obvious you wouldn't grind a clearance angle down the whole length of the shank of the tool. But you could hold it at an angle away from the tool so that it sort of falls away naturally and gives you that built-in clearance angle. You could do the same thing on the lead angle, and that way both sort of the left-hand side face in this orientation and the side facing the work automatically have clearance. The only thing left to grind would be the top. 
Allow me for clarity's sake to just sort of restate that. With the tool mounted in the traditional manner, every time you grind this tool, you have to check those relief and clearance angles because you're moving back into square sections of the tool shank. But if you orient the faces that you need to grind ahead of time, well, you don't need to grind them. So if you were to put the tool tangentially and have the side facing the work kind of drop away, you never really need to grind that side because it's always at seven or eight or 12 degrees. And you can do the same thing to the leading edge. Swing the tool this way, and now we have both the clearance angles. In this orientation, we'd have a lot less grinding to do. In fact, we'd only really need to grind the top. So now you might be asking yourself, how in God's name do you hold a tool like that? And therein is sort of the rub. You need a special tool holder. You don't need to do as much grinding, but you need a tool holder. Now you could make one or you can buy one. These types of tool holders are called tangential tool holders, sometimes called diamond tool holders. Now I don't have a tangential tool holder and I've never used a tangential cutting tool. I'm just telling you what I heard, man. But we'll try to make one real quick and see how it works. So let's look at those pictures again. A respectable tool holder would have some type of clamping system. If you'd like to build one, just, you know, look around on the internet and try to get some ideas there. For demonstration purposes, I'm just going to hack one together. Probably weld it using a smaller piece of high-speed steel. Let me get some stuff set up on the mill. We'll machine a quick tool holder and weld in this small piece of high-speed steel. Like before, I'm going to shoot for about a 7 or 8 degree clearance angle on both sides. So I just grabbed the first piece of steel that I found that sort of looks like a tool holder body. Just some hot rolled steel. To keep from making any bonehead moves, I'm going to just kind of label this. I want this to be the top. And the tool would need to lean to the left in this case and back on this side. So in setting this up to mill it, we want to leave this edge here high and everything else drops away. Now I'm just going to tip this in two directions, but if you were actually going to make one of these, it's probably smart to lay it out on paper or in CAD. I'm sure there's some compound angle effect going on here. Also, if you had a vise that swiveled, you wouldn't need an angle plate. I'm now going to rotate this and screw it down to the T-slots. Now, modesty makes this a little bit difficult for me to say, but you may just be looking at the setup of the year. It's better than it looks. I'm just going to take it nice and easy. So we're over here in my vise. I cut this with the indexable end mill that was sort of already loaded in the mill, and it left a bit of a radius down in the corner there. I should have used just a regular end mill had I thought of it. But I'm just going to hit this with a hacksaw just to relieve that inside corner. That should do it. Next, I'm just going to cut the top of this tool bit off. So I've dropped the tip of the tool about 15 degrees in both directions. That's about 7 or 8 degrees for the tool holder and another 7 or 8 degrees for the sort of top rake. And again, that's in both directions. Which results in that diagonal cut kind of across the sharps of the tool. The top ends up looking like a diamond shape. I think that's where that diamond name might come from. Let me attach this to the tool holder and we'll see what it looks like on the lathe. Oh, and Stefan, if you're watching, this was all done freehand. Read them and weep, buddy. All right, so it might not be the classiest act in town, but there it is. Let's give it a try. It's 
try some cold rolled steel. This is about an inch and a quarter, or 30 millimeters or so. Before I try this, I'm just going to put a small radius on the tip of this tool. This is very sharp. I wouldn't expect it to leave a, any kind of surface finish the way it is now. That was painfully slow. And about 20 thou depth of cut. Let's try 60 thou depth of cut. Alright, all told, that wasn't too bad. It's got that signature high-speed steel surface finish. I think I might have been running that a little bit slow, though. So, that could probably get, uh, you know, smidge better. And the tool still seems to be holding up. Anyway, until I get some more fiber in me, I think that's all I've got for now. Thanks for watching.